Uh, so now we're at Studio X for all of those who, who started out on the walk. And uh, for those of you who didn't, we actually uh, have more sheets for you to be able to go and do the walk on your own in your own time, so you won't miss out. Um, but Studio X is an off-campus event space and workspace run by the architecture department at Columbia University. I co-directed along with Jeff there, who will be popping up and down to take photos. Um, and we hold events that look at the city in, in different ways. So tomorrow night we have a book launch for Future Practice by Rory Hyde. So you can come back for that. On Friday we have, at starting at 1 and running till 6, a festival of dredge, dredge fest. Um, looking at the ways in which uh, uh, dredging and uh, all of its associated sort of rebuilding activities have reshaped the coast and the harbor of Manhattan and the city itself. Um, so that'll be on Friday. On Saturday, we're going out on a boat with the Army Corps of Engineers to actually check out some dredge in person. Um, so you can still get tickets for that and come along with us. So that just gives you a taste of the kinds of events we have. We have a mailing list at the back um, that you can sign up to find out about those ahead of time. Um, the one piece of housekeeping that I will say is that there are bathroom keys opposite the mailing list on the little shelf thing, and they are gender coded, so grab one and use the restroom whenever you need to. And now I am going to introduce, um, for those of you who were on the walk, I didn't do a very long introduction, and um, for those of you who weren't, this is the, this is the introduction. Uh, to tonight's speaker, Victoria Henshaw. She's a research associate in architecture and urbanism at the University of Manchester. Um, but she actually worked um, for a number of, number of years uh, prior to sort of going into academia as a city manager in all sorts of city um, and gov local and central government positions. So she comes from that very practical um, perspective and then moved into academia, wrote her PhD thesis on smell and urban design, smell in cities, what kinds of uh, intentional and unintentional smellscapes we're creating for ourselves and how that impacts urban design and urban living. And uh, I interviewed her, I first came across her when she'd done the smell walk of Sheffield, focusing on a, um, a Henderson's relish factory. <laughs> Um, and I uh, just thought that sounded fascinating, so I interviewed her and um, thought that the way she was thinking about intentional design and smellscapes was really, really, you know, something that we could all be thinking about in much more interesting ways. So I'm thrilled she's joining us tonight and I will hand it over. Thank you. So hi everyone. <laughs> and also thank you all for coming along. Um, it's my favourite topic in the world, is talking to people about smell in the city and I absolutely, my family are fed up of hearing about it so it's always wonderful to come and speak to other people about it. Um, as Nicola said, my research up for my PhD was um, examining the role of smell in urban design um, and uh, I'm publishing, the, well, the, the results of that are being published uh, next summer by Rutledge, um, which I'm absolutely um, amazed about and really pleased about um, that that's happening because there's been quite um, a body of uh, work has um, been uh, published over the past 20 years about designing soundscapes um, and smell really is something that we haven't been thinking about as architects and urban designers in any great detail um, so I'm really pleased that that's, that book's, the book's going to come out so that um, it starts to progress our thinking and, and debate and encourage discussion about how we might think about smell in the city um, so I'm going to be talking about a lot of those findings today and drawing from um, recent research I've been carrying out as well in a number of different cities I've been carrying out um, work on uh, carrying out the, uh, the smell walks such as the one that I've, we've done today um, in different cities and identifying what sort of smells we can detect and what people think about them. Okay, so the things I'm going to be talking about is, um, first of all, the value that we place on the sense of smell um, as a society and 
as a, what I call built environment professionals, but within that I include architects, urban designers, engineers, planners, um, and the likes. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the sense of smell, um, because it's not something that a lot of people know a lot about. And so I think it's always useful to run through some of those basics, um, because certainly when I started my research, I found it difficult to locate all of the um, various things that have been written about smell within one kind of discipline. It, I've really had to draw from right across the disciplines, so I always think it's useful to highlight some of those factors. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about smellscapes of historical cities, because if there is one area that smell has been talked about in relation to the city in the past, it's more about historical smells. Um, but I will uh, touch upon those um, and then go into more detail about the smell of contemporary cities and look, look at the urban um, control processes relating to smell um, those factors of how we're influencing smell environments today um, I'll, I'll talk about those in more detail um, I'm going to quickly then look at to uh, how those uh, that theory and um, understanding relates to two practical examples of grass in the south of France, um, which many of you may know is the perfume production centre of the world. And so we have Paris, which is kind of the marketing centre, known as the marketing centre, but in grass they grow most of the jasmine for Chanel number no. five, a very famous um, smellscape. Um, and then I'm going to talk about kind of what all this all means for um, urban design and architectural practice and highlight some design to tools, some smell design tools that emerged as a result of talking through some of these issues with architects and urban designers. And then there'll be the most exciting bit um, for me uh, is the questions where I can hear more about you know, what you think about smell um, and you can examine me on some of those other issues in further detail, the ones that you're particularly interested in. Oh, just to go back to this image, um, this image is of um, the Zabaline community in Cairo, which some of you may be familiar with, but Zabaline means um, garbage collector. And you may see there's a little girl at the bottom of the image there, and actually this was one of the factors that um, raised my interest in smellscapes because if we think of Cairo, the city Cairo, it's um, promoting itself as a, very, a contemporary city and if we think as we walk down kind of the high street there there'll be all these shops and, and then suddenly can you imagine if the wind's blowing we have five of these Zabaline communities um, located very cheap by jowl really with the, the main um, contemporary areas of Cairo and the Zabaline community sort the waste, they're, they're effectively the recycling hub of Cairo and they live in the waste, they recycle the waste, they sort it and you can see kind of this, this is a house here where the washing's been hung out and so you can imagine the smell of that area um, smells very differently to how we might imagine some of our um, towns and cities and com com in the contemporary environment smelling. Okay, so the question, does society value some senses more than others? Well, clearly it does. Um, and one of the areas where I looked to start trying to place some idea on this, place some value on it, was insurance claims advice. <laughs> in the UK, um, they advise, and this was in 2008, um, that you would get up to £155,000 for a total loss of sight. Um, and as you can see, hearing is valued to approximately a third of the level of that. And then we go right down to between 14,500 to £19,000 for a total loss of the sense of smell. So you can see that in monetary terms, um, it's been valued in mu uh, to a much lesser degree than we are with sight and hearing. And the only one that was kind of valued lower was the uh, sense of taste. And actually, um, as many of you will be aware, taste and smell are very closely interlinked anyway. So if you lose your sense of smell, then you lose about 80% of your sense of taste anyway. But why is that? Is that natural? 
Um, does that occur for everyone? I mean, after all, um, as the uh, UK's National Disability Authority said in its, um, in its guidance on building for everyone, uh, we use all our senses to experience our surroundings. We smell the new mown grass, hear the babbling brook, feel the gentle breeze on our cheek and see the dappled sunlight through the trees. We rarely taste our surroundings, but what we do taste always tastes better in surroundings which satisfy our other senses. Environments which appeal to only one sense and impoverish others are themselves impoverished. And it raises some important questions. You know, are some senses truly more valuable and meaningful than others? Um, and it made me think, really, at the outset of my PhD, that is this rather a vicious circle where we're designing environments where we don't think about the sense of smell, and as a result, we're, le we're appreciating less the potential opportunities that it offers to us. Or, as Winston Churchill said, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. So is this a vicious circle? Um, but one thing I always say is that you have to first watch out for the red herring and that is that in Western society we classify, generally we think of five senses, although the academic community um, argue with others um, as well. But certainly within different cultures um, they organise the senses in different ways and actually when you try and separate the senses into the known five, the, uh, the commonly accepted five, it's not as clear cut as you think. So when we think of uh, vibration, for example, is something that we feel, um, it's actually sound waves that we feel. So um, really, uh, it's the same with smell. Um, we actually detect smells through our olfactory receptors. I'll show you a model of that in a second. But we also use our touch nerve in our face. Um, which is called the trigeminal nerve, so more of that later, but I think it's important just to highlight that it's not as simplistic as, as five senses. So just to briefly touch upon historical cities and smell. Well, first of all, I'm sure you're all aware that pre-industrial cities smelt very differently to our cities of today. The people, there were lots of people in the street milling around. As we saw, you know, you, you experience that in New York every day as well. Lots of people in close proximity to one another. But the streets were, were very dirty. Um, we didn't have the, um, the, the materials on the ground as we do now. And very much there was um, mud stuck to people's shoes and, and clothes. And you, every time you walked into a building, you'd be scraping off the mud. Um, so they were very dirty places. You'd have animals slaughtered. Um, and then the blood would be thrown out into the, um, into the street. You sometimes get dead animals in the street as well. Um, and animals actually lived in many of these properties as they do in some countries today. Um, and actually, uh, if you were in one of these properties, um, because until glass was introduced into them, then uh, there was very poor ventilation. Um, and actually, if you were a stranger arriving into the city then you would hire part of a bed to sleep in um, which seemed very strange today <laughs> and of course there used to be very smelly industries as well and they would be all mixed up with the residential properties the uh, businesses, the places where we would eat. Um, and so the tanneries, the breweries, and the tallow chandlers would uh, be very, emitting very, very strong odours directly into the streets. So that's quite different to what we have today. And of course, industrialisation then brought with it the kind of large scale pollution of the air in cities. Um, which impacted in turn on the smell environment. We had the smogs um, that you could see, the combination of the smoke and the fog. Um, and then during industrialisation, we had the massive population growth, so more and more people living in close densities. Um, the coal fires didn't help as well. The smell of the coal fires in my research, I, I grew up in a mining area and, um, and everybody used to burn coal. And it certainly influenced the smell environment quite significantly where that heavy smell um, would be in the air and it would mask some of the other odours that were there. 
respiratory illnesses. Interestingly, people um, used to fear um, disease more than they did respiratory illnesses. Um, and so that influenced how they used to think about smell and the air in general. The waterways were highly polluted. Um, until we started separating those into the, um, the sewage, the modern sewage systems that we have today. Parks started to be introduced um, to introduce the lungs to the city and pavements and different materials were introduced which clearly then influenced the smell environment by influencing the, we were able to start washing away different odours. And then there was this change in the perception of body odour as well. Bathing became more common and as a result those people that had access to bathing facilities started to smell quite differently to those people that didn't. Um, and so we had the rich who um, were able to wash away those body odour smells as compared to the poorer people who were associated with um, you know, sm smelling of more natural bodily smells. And then modernism, when we started to rise into the air and were able to, through the skyscrapers, actually um, move away from the, um, the throng of the streets um, and the idea of the dominating gaze where the rich were able to kind of look down on the poorer people. Um, and also at the time it was believed very much about miasmas thought to um, kind of escape from the ground and pollute the air. And the smells of those were thought to spread disease. And the block layout um, started to uh, be introduced as well to maximise the air th flow through the city. And of course then the motor, motor vehicles were introduced which um, have subsequently um, massively influenced our smellscapes um, of the towns and, our towns and cities today. Um, so in terms of New York, you know, the position of New York's grid, um, we know it was laid out in particular to promote the health of the city by allowing for the free and abundant circulation of air. But then to bring us up to date, the postmodern world and how we're thinking about smell. Well, um, in many environments, smells are being considered, particularly in the um, commercial world. Um, we have smells being introduced into some of the um, casinos, the hotels, uh, into theme parks to make an experience more believable. So it's something that's being thought about in terms of those designed experiential theme park etc. Um, but it isn't something that really as urban designers and architects we've been thinking about very proactively. And Martin Lindstrom, some of you may be familiar with his work on Brand Sense, is a book he uh, published in 2005 where he considers um, the role of smell in uh, the marketing of services and products. If you haven't seen that, I'd recommend it, um, to have a read of that. Um, and he really thinks about that and argues that smell has a, a crucial role in the way that we perceive different objects. So to move Slightly away from cities and just in, into briefing you really about the basics on the um, sense of smell. There were all sorts of things when I started my research that kind of blew me away thinking about smell I, that I wasn't aware of at all. Um, and really the way, the way that the sense of smell works um, influences our experiences but significantly. Um, I mean it's amazing to think really how little we know about the sense of smell and it wasn't until the 1990s when Buck and Axel published a paper um, that there was any scientific consensus about how the sense of smell worked. Um, they later went on and won the Nobel Prize in 2004 for their work. Um, and effectively, we have our olfactory receptors, our smell receptors in our noses. And what the smell receptors do is when we kind of detect a smell, the different receptors each can detect a few smells. So um, 
When we breathe in a smell, they effectively detect the smell and create a pattern. If you think of it as light, it lights up into a pattern, those olfactory receptors that detect the smell. And so our brain recognises the pattern or recognises that it's unfamiliar. And so somebody was asking me a question on the smell walk about what about the smell of uh, honey lavender, well, lavendered honey. <laughs> and actually what would happen there is our olfactory detect receptors that detect honey and our olfactory receptors that detect lavender will both light up, create a pattern that then our brain starts to recognise as lavender honey. And so every time we smell that, we'll recognise that that's what it is or something like it. So, you know, very simplistically, that's how our olfactory receptors work. They create a pattern. But... There are different factors that are also at play. One of them is this close relationship between smell and taste. Now, when we think about that, um, when we think about particularly things like sickness, if we've eaten something, uh, we've been ill, in pregnancy, there could be things that you've eaten during pregnancy and then afterwards you just can't touch. And it's because of this inbuilt um, system where the sense of smell is trying to protect us from danger. Um, so if we've eaten something and we associate it with sickness, then often the smell will then really be something that we don't dislike. So I've carried out smell surveys that I'll show you the results of shortly, uh, where I've asked people to list their five most favourite smells in the world and the five least favourite smells. And some of the smells that people send through as least favourite are quite astounding and peculiar, you know, very, very specific. So you'll have things like the smell of Weetabix, you know, the smell of um, a particular type of biscuit or a particular type of crisps, you know, as a least favourite smell. When you think of all the horrible smells people could list, you know, why did they list those? So I've asked people about this in more detail and it almost always comes down to some personal experience with that particular product. So for example, um, somebody responded by saying that one of their least favourite smells were, was um, something, a custard cream biscuit, a bis particular type of biscuit we eat in the UK. And, um, and he says that as soon as he smells that, he starts to feel sick. So I asked him why, and he said that as a child, he sat there eating a custard cream biscuit and it had a water on it and he bit into it and he bit his cheek and he chewed it and he tasted the blood of the wasp and felt the pain and now all he has to do is smell a custard cream biscuit and that's it he's running to the toilet um, so and I'm sure we all have experiences like that the trigeminal nerve, um, the touch nerve in our face. Uh, now this is something that's not widely written about at all, but the trigeminal nerve, they're the only inbuilt smell preference we have when we're born, is that we're less likely to like trigeminally detected smells. Now you may think, what on earth is she talking about here? What's the trigeminal nerve? <laughs> Well, when we think about smells like petrol, diesel, chemicals, nail varnish remover, nail varnish, those kind of, you know the type kind of smells that I'm talking about, we get a little tingle in our nose, a little kind of feeling, um, sometimes in the back of your throat as well, and those smells are the trigeminal nerve smells. Now, um, in the 1960s, some highly unethical studies, I'm sure they were, where they wafted lots of different smells in front of babies to see what they did. And um, one of the things that they did was it wafted these trigeminal smells and they found that it's the one smell that babies really don't like is the trigeminal smell. So they pull an automatic face of disgust, which um, with, there are different disgust faces, but the dis this particular disgust face limits the amount of air that you allow into your body. So we know that babies will automatically pull that response um, to uh, these trigeminal smells. Um, and actually... As we go older, some of us um, learn to love the trigeminal smells. Some of us like them less. When I did, I've done the smell preference survey, some people say uh, they'll list five trigeminal smells as their most favourite because they really like having their trigeminal nerves tickled. Um, but this does interrelate with our city experiences quite significantly, as I'll go on to show you in a little while. 
pheromones. Well, um, there's a book by, uh, I think it's Doty, the, Fe- the Pheromone Myth, and there are very few studies that show the pheromones have any response, uh, any impact on us as human beings. Clearly they do in the animal world, um, but for us, um, I mean we are animals <laughs> in many different ways, um, but uh, pheromones, the only study that has found any link between pheromones and it having an effect on human beings is um, when you have a number of different women living in a house together and their menstrual cycles correlate and that is um, put, is put down to pheromones, the influence of pheromones but there are no other studies that have actually found this um, effect of pheromones and the human behaviour so all these kind of ads about perfume and all that, yes we all have our favourite perfumes and the ones that we may find more sexually attractive but it's more down to association um, and our kind of our learned behaviours and our personal experiences that influence that rather than it being a pheromone Saying that, I have a sample of a pheromone that I'm going to start handing around for people to have a smell of. Um, and that's interesting. <laughs> well, not a pheromone, it's a, it's a hormone. Um, so I'll just go and uh, just bear with me. I'll just grab this so we can start to go around. But I'll just explain a little bit about it um, and why it's so interesting. Um, there are very few smells that have been identified that some people can smell and some people can't. Um, androsterone is one of them. Um, so I've got a little pot of androsterone and it's going to be very interesting to find out what you all think about it because androsterone is otherwise known as the caveman smell. Um, now all of you will detect something in that pot because it smells quite, um, even if you don't detect the smell you'll, you may smell the alcohol that kind of the smells carried in. Um, but some of you, 40% of people can smell the smell, um, 60% of you can't. Um, and if you smell it, 90% of those people that can smell it can smell strong body odour, which is why it's called the caveman smell. And I know um, if you see someone um, who fully detects it, they'll usually kind of do a recoil to it. Um, the other 10% um, smell flowers, roses, and some people become be quite attracted to it. So um, I'm going to just start that hunting round. And, uh, while I'm talking, I'll be interested to see if there are any responses. And please do tell me at the end. Um, well, I'll do a quick hands up as to see who's had what kind of response. So I'll just grab that quickly. Right. Okay. A bit my special package here, so it doesn't break in my hands. There, I have to put it in my suitcase when I'm travelling because there's no way I'm getting through security. It might have a little bit. Is there a little button? Stop. 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 Stop.
um, flowers, petrol, diesel. So to say there is this trigeminal smell of petrol and diesel, actually um, a lot of people like it as a favourite. I actually really like the smell of petrol and diesel. Babies, children, oh, the sea, countryside trees, laundry, soap powder. Least favourite smells. No surprise there, 55% said body odour. And actually, when it comes to faeces, people are very specific, you know, which is why human and animal appear in there. People use, many people are listed twice. Um, cigarette smoke, vomit, gone, you know, you're getting the drift, are you? Um, there's a lot of this is related to rotting smells, um, and those are smells that will appear in, uh, no matter where you carry out the survey, they'll usually appear in one form or another. Um, but that's kind of, it's those learnt uh, smells, we learn that these smells are not good. Where it's interesting, I think, is when you actually, and where it's of use to us, particularly when we think about design, is that you can see here that just in that small sample of 100 people, um, you start to see that some people like some smells and some people dislike. So these are just their most liked and least liked. And so coffee appeared as somebody's um, least liked. Cut grass. If they have hay fever, you know, cut grass was kind of a fit appearing as a least favourite for some people. Flowers, particular types of flowers, petrol, diesel, perfume aftershave. So some people like particular ones but didn't like other ones. Um, babies, children, um, but as you can see, body odour is the big one there. That actually, um, body odour, although there are a lot of people who say that they don't like it, it all depends on whose body odour it is, you can smell it. A lot of people were naming their partner's body odour as one that they like. Um, so it, uh, this, this appears time and time again on studies of people and their smell perception of one another, is that really it's those straight, it's people that are different to us, it's strangers that we less likely to like the, the body odour. And factors that influence smell perception. Well, perception, when I talk about perception, I'm talking about the actual detection of the odour and then the way that we think about it. And that's impacted upon by all sorts of different characteristics. So our gender, as I said at the start of the smell walk, um, women have a slightly better sense of smell um, in terms of what they detect and their ability to name them, but it is very small. Um, and it's only between certain ages of about 14 and 65, so it's hormonal. Um, age, as sadly, our sense of smell um, deteriorates as we get older. Um, illness influences it quite significantly and our sensitivity as well. Culture is highly um, significant in our smell detection and perception. Um, our personal experiences, as I, I've talked about, but also our expectations. When we think about urban space, um, our expectations of different types of places and spaces um, really is quite significant in terms of smell. We'd expect um, Chinatown to smell very differently than we would do to a park, to the waterfront, um, to inside an office building. There are all sorts of factors that influence odour and the way that it moves around as well, as I'll come to in, a, in more detail in a little while. But the nature of the source, the type of source, and to how strongly it emits the odours, and the concentration of odours, it doesn't matter if it smells our most favourite smell in the world, if it's suitably concentrated, um, we'll not like it. So it represents a potential danger to us if smells are, are too strong. The weather has a significant impact, the heat will make those evaporate, the smells evaporate quicker. The time of the day, we have different expectations of the time of the day, and the topography influences how a smell moves around the city. But I'm sure you're all aware of this association between smell and memory. Now, just the way that the brain is hooked up means that um, the sense of smell, when we actually detect something, once we've detected something and it's in our brains, we're far less likely to forget it than we are the way things look. Um, I've got a diagram that kind of shows you that in a second. I'll just show you this one first. 
Um, all my participants, my smell walks, I've asked them um, to rate their sense of smell. And we did this little experiment for those that attended the smell walk to see how people gravitated towards um, whether they thought they got a good sense of smell or a bad sense of smell. Um, when I've asked men and women about this, um, my participants were 65% of the women generally say that they've got high, a good sense of smell, um, a good to very good, uh, whereas only 28% of the men do. But actually, there's a very small difference in terms of what the men and the women detect when we go out there. The big difference is in disgust. So the men are finding things far less disgusting than the women are. Um, and that's influencing the way that people perceive their own ability to smell the world. Um, this um, diagram show was um, back from the 1970s in Engen, Trig Engen, um, who uh, undertook lots of work on smell and smell perception. And this kind of shows um, how long we retain um, information about smell as compared to visual information in our minds. And you can see that um, over a 12 month period here, um, people were shown pictures and then they were exposed to smells. And actually, um, people were far less likely to recall the, s the smells in the short term. But once they were in their minds, they kind of stuck there. And this is one of the reasons why you know, we'll sometimes smell something and it kind of transports us back through space and time to the point when we either first smelt it or the most important time of when we detected an odour. So there is often a misconception that it's just the first time we smell something that we kind of are transported back to, but it's not, it's the most notable, which really is quite, um, it's quite obvious really. Um, so it, it is possible for a smell to be completely overwritten, the meaning of it in our minds. Okay, so how does the contemporary city smell? Well, here's what a few people have had to say about it. Lefebvre, he said that the sense of smell had its glory days when an animality still predominated over culture. Um, and basically, he's arguing that today, um, as a, all built environment professions, are effectively bringing about the complete atrophy of smell, which he's arguing that we're kind of... Um, trying to get rid of smell. Um, but many people argue that that's too simplistic. Um, Senate argues that this focusing upon visual aspects of the environment and environmental design, architecture, urban design, has resulted in a sensory deprivation which seems to curse most modern buildings. The dullness, the monotony, and the tactile sterility which afflicts the urban environment. And Ivan Illich says that increasingly the whole world has come to smell alike. Gasoline detergents, plumbing and junk foods coalesce into the Catholic smog of our age. And I'm sure we can all relate to this in some way or another and can kind of understand that that's the case. But my, I prefer this um, that Herb Eleanor, the architect Herb Eleanor suggests which is that smell falls within the dark side of architecture. And effectively, I know that when I was in practice, it's just not something that crossed our radars. Um, unless something was smelling particularly bad, if we were going to have an, a, a potentially offensive, offensive smell emitter, it's not something we thought about. We certainly didn't think about it in terms of what we were designing. So when I've carried out the smell walks, um, I've considered what smells people have detected and I've kind of broadly categorised these. And when, before I carry out the walks, um, when I do them on a one-to-one -one basis, I ask people to describe to me what they think the city smells like, um, what kind of smells they might detect. And usually they're quite limited. Um, but actually, once you've undertaken a smell walk, and I think that's why it's kind of it's useful for you to also think about those smells that you've detected while you've been out walking today, it's actually far more various than we might first consider. And part of that is down to how our sense of smell operates. I mean, it's there, we're breathing in and we're breathing out all the time. And so it's quite necessary, really, that our brain isn't always processing and telling us consciously what smells we're detecting. So it's quite necessary that we we only really detect, consciously register those ones that are a potential threat to us, potential danger, or particularly stroll or a source of pleasure, for example. Um, but most of these kind of everyday smells will be detecting as we walk around. 
And here's, you know, some of the common ones, pollution, we would uh, traffic pollution, but also people associate the industrial pollution as well. Um, food of one variety or another. Cigarette smoke, since we had our smoking legislation in, introduced in the UK, and clearly you have smoking legislation here as well, and the smell of the streets has changed quite significantly. What we've found is that although fewer people are smoking in general, there are more smoking out in the street. And for any of you that have visited any of our pubs in the UK, um, the smell has changed very significantly. Um, as a result, people are, the publicans, the licensees, are having to clean those places far more than they used to have to because the smoke used to mask the smells. Um, but people were really quite resentful of detecting smoke in the outside environment because suddenly they're faced with all these people stood in doorways um, and they're not used to it, so it's kind of it's not meeting their expectations of what the urban environment smells like and they're quite resistant to it. Temporal smells, the evening economy, um, I, I talk about olfactory hangover, the smell of, um, we detect sometimes if we're walking to work or university in the mornings, um, you'll detect smells from the evening before and you kind of think, oh, whereas the night before you're perhaps you know, less likely to be as offended by some of those. And then there are smells clearly, the commercial smells emitted from the, um, from the shops. I highlighted Lush particularly here because um, Lush was a store that um, we had in Doncaster, a town where I did a lot of my research in the north of England. And I found that the smell of the Lush stores really split people down the middle. Some people really liked it and some people really hated it. And, and people were avoiding whole blocks rather than smell this smell because it was so strong. Construction as well is clearly something that, um, that we smell in the city day by day. And last week when I was um, in Montreal, um, to me the whole city smelled of paint. I could smell paint everywhere. I don't know if it was something that was just in the air or whether it was all the construction that was taking place. So when we think about control management and design of the smell environment, um, I, I've drawn from Rodaway, who was one of the first people who kind of argued about the favourers and you know, completely wiping out smells, the idea that we as uh, professionals, built environment professionals, were wiping out all odour. And he argued that it wasn't as, a, a, it wasn't as simple as that. And certainly, ooh, somebody's online now, <laughs> certainly uh, that was something that I found within my research. Um, and so I talk about separation, masking, deodorization, and scenting. So separate, separation, we think about how different our cities are today than what they used to be. You know, here we've got the zoning, uh, so increasingly you have that zoning and the separation of those smelly industries from the centre of a town or city, and increasing control on them as well actually. Um, we see the industrial manufacturing, retail, leisure and entertainment separated out. Um, and as a result, we actually, farming can smell far stronger than it did. So say some of the big chicken farms that we have um, really smell a lot stronger than they used to when you used to have kind of mixed farms, uh, wastewater plants, abattoirs and the likes. You have separation through displacement. Now, pedestrianisation is great. I love pedestrianisation, fantastic. But what you find is it has a displacement effect, not only in terms of the traffic, but also in terms of the smells that go with the traffic. So you may have an environment where it's pedestrianised, where it's, as one of my participants described, you're free to smell those good smells. They're out there for the smelling. Um, not disguised by some of the heavy traffic odours, but actually you step into the area then away from that and you have kind of this donut effect where the smells are concentrated then from the traffic immediately around in that er uh, surrounding that area. Separation from source, our sophisticated ventilation systems, which often are released then up in the sky or behind properties, so we have smells uh, rerouted from kitchens into those areas and so I, when I do smell walks in Manchester where I'm based um, I always take people down kind of these back alleyways in Chinatown and every step you get a different smell as the smells are cooking and are coming out so you have kind of your official front of house smells and then your back of house smells as well. Uh, separating the pro a product from its uh, smell, so the durian fruit. Has anyone ever tried or smelled the durian fruit? Excellent! <laughs> the durian fruit is supposed to be this one
one of the smelliest foods in existence and certainly one of the smelliest fruits. Um, it's so smelly that it's not allowed, it's illegal to take it on um, some subway system, such as Singapore's subway system. Uh, but now it's been bred so that um, the smell doesn't actually appear until a week after it's picked, um, so that it can be transported. <laughs> And then temp temporal separation, as I already mentioned, but just kind of an important point there is over history, quite with immeasurable history, our smell expectations of the city have changed significantly. And the way that we've kind of we've done that, deodorisation, materials, some of the materials that we've introduced are really we can very much wash away smells from those. And then our kind of our, our, the way that we've um, you know that we clean our streets and wash them. We've seen lots of that this evening. Um, when we think about the bins, sophisticated waste management systems that we have are all designed at kind of getting away those kind of those poorly perceived odours. And then we have masking. Now this can occur both um, as a byproduct of something else and as uh, being planned. Um, so when we think about the traffic, for example, now traffic odours are influencing our smell experiences in all sorts of different ways in the city. I mean, first of all, the smells themselves are very strong, um, so they can overlay and mask those more subtle smells that might be in our, in our environments that perhaps you may have been able to detect in the past. Um, the pollutants as well that are emitted by traffic also um, affect our ability to smell the world around us. And so people who live in highly polluted cities such as Mexico City um, will never regain the sense of smell that they had before moving to that city once they leave. So it permanently has the ability to permanently damage our sense of smell. But within a city on a short-term basis as well, the lesser polluted cities, um, is able to kind of temporarily affect our ability to smell the world. And also, um, many of these pollutants from traffic that are in the air have the ability to break the smell down as it travels through the air. So a smell actually can't travel as far as it used to be able to. So again, in highly polluted cities, some of the smells can only travel about third of the distance that they used to be able to travel. Um, and we know this with, um, say, many of the um, like bees, for example, now have to spend a lot longer in, around, in and around urban areas actually finding the smells than they did before. It's one of the reasons blamed for kind of a, the reducing bee populations. Um, and there are, you may have seen these in some of the supermarkets where there are these um, Rather than just being air fresheners where you're kind of you're ma overlaying another smell, um, actually there are these uh, the chemicals now that you can introduce where it says it eliminates the odour. So odour eliminators. And there are these chemicals in, that are there. And effectively what they do is they prevent our ability to smell those other smells that are there. Um, but originally these were de uh, developed for, say, the hog odors, the big hog farms, the idea of introducing those into the air. But effectively if we do that, we can't smell those other smells. So they're never released on that large scale, or certainly the, if they have been, it's not being documented. And so that, that traffic is really uh, playing a key role in masking our experiences of other smells. So you may actually find, uh, that, that, say in Montreal, there was an area last week that we walked down the street and people were expecting to smell all sorts of different smells and they didn't get any of them. And that could well be down to the influence of the masking effect of the traffic in that area. And then scenting. When I talk to people about urban smell environments, um, when I originally speak to architects and urban designers, I'll say to them, how might we go about thinking about smell? And usually scenting is the one that people jump to first. They think about introducing a smell, a nice smell. Bearing in mind there are no nice or there are no good or bad smells, it's all learnt. <laughs> um, into areas with the idea of improving them. So when we think of, say, Sky Centre in the Triangle in Manchester, they released a coffee cloud. The scent of coffee cloud to um, announce this new place was opening. Um, Lessons to Meisterbrook, they have a little vial of perfume that's been developed of their village, and whenever somebody leaves, they give a little vial of this so they can take it away and think of their dream about their village, and also uh, they can let other people smell it as well, um, to uh, presumably to encourage them to go to Meisterbrook. Um, vanilla ice, <laughs> the ice skating rink that was up in the Eiffel Tower, and then outdoor advertisements are increasingly common. This one in San Francisco, um, which was the smell of cookies, and it was to promote milk. 
Um, it was there for a day and then it was taken down because of environmental sensitivities. Um, now, environmental sensitivities is a lot more well known here in the States and Canada than it is in the UK. Um, usually when I mention environmental sensitivities to the Brits, um, the majority of them are kind of so, well, what? what? <laughs> what what's that? Um, but when you talk about specifics like uh, sick building syndrome, and you know, if they talk about asthma, then clearly it's known. But as a phrase, it's not something that we, we widely deal with. And our expectations are very different, actually, in the UK in terms of scents being released into the environment than they are in some other countries. I mean, this photograph, there's been an explosion of smell adverts in the environment in the UK over the past 12 months. Um, this was um, the smell of jacket potatoes, baked potatoes, as they were released into the air from this bus stop in London. Um, there's also been the smell of Mr. Kipling cakes released, coffee odours, we've had lots of them perceived in different ways. Interestingly, when I've interviewed people stood at these bus stops, the vast majority like it because they're there only briefly, the kind of it's quite a novel thing, they're quite positive about the whole thing. Um, but interestingly, there was a market trader who was stood behind and had his stall behind one of these bus stops and he thought of it completely differently. It was really annoying, the smell. He talked about he was, he'd got a blocked nose, he'd had all sorts of headaches, he'd went to his doctor, he'd written to his council and he'd even, when the, um, when the engineer came to refill the smell, um, he even went to and had a go at him as well. Um, so it's perceived very differently depending on what control, how long you're exposed to the smells for, the degree of control you have over them, etc. So globalisation, homogenisation and the olfactory environment. Um, you know, clearly our smellscapes, just as the way our cities are increasingly looking alike, they're also increasingly smelling alike as well, fueled by consumption. I had to include the casino there as well because um, there's been all sorts of studies about um, smells in different environments and Hertz um, talked about uh, introducing a smell subliminally into a casino would, in, would um, he, he argued that it would increase the gambling rate by 40%. Um, but some of the studies within kind of the marketing field are um, uh, perhaps not as rigorous as um, they, we would like them to be. Um, but there's some interesting work um, being undertaken on those. So a quick case to just show you how this work works on a practical level. Grass in the south of France. Well, they have a perfumed fountain. <laughs> I've not seen this smell this anywhere else. Um, but I was uh, stood in the centre of grass and thought, what's that smell? And there was a perfume fountain uh, next to me. Um, but not only do they have kind of the smells that scent in introduced, they have rigorous rules about what is allowed and what isn't. They're cleaning up like there's no tomorrow. I've never seen as many dog waste bins as these, the most dog waste bins I've seen in any town or city. Um, they have um, flowers in their murals, as you would expect, sculptures, outside the casino, and then. To top it all, I think this is my most favourite, is the large bottle of Chanel number no. 5 they have outside the Hotel de Ville, I think it is on the Palais de Congress, um, which is quite amazing. Um, but Grasse in the 1950s was the richest, the most wealthiest city in all of France. Um, but now that's not the case and um, they have very rich people in grass and they have very poor people as well. And they have a lot of um, northern African communities that have moved in there. And um, it struck me as I walked about the city how the smell environment changed so dramatically as I went into some of these poor areas. And you know, there weren't the perfume fountains, there weren't the flower murals. Um, it very much started to smell different. So just as we can kind of sense um, through the way things look, we could sense through the olfactory environment as well, um, whether it was a wealthy area, a poorer area. And that is, exists perhaps in less dramatic terms, but it does exist within our towns and cities today. And we expect certain smells within rundown areas, as my participants describe them to me, um, such as the smells of pollution, vomit, um, you know, anything related to dirt, really. Um, 
than the wealthier areas and the private areas as compared to the public areas where we would expect more rigorous cleansing regimes and, and more scenting as well. So New York smellscape, and just to touch upon smell mapping as part of that. And mystery smells, well, I mean, New York's a, a really interesting place. I think more's been written about the smell environment of New York than anywhere else. And there are a couple of mystery smells that I'm sure many of you here might have even had personal experience of. Um, and it's getting, yeah, I'm starting to think about these mystery smells. I'm sure there's a lot more mileage in that, thinking about mystery smells around the world. Uh, but you know, when? Uh, overnight, in October 2005, there was a sweet syrupy odour, like maple syrup and caramel. Did any of you detect it? Hands up if you detect it. Brilliant. <laughs> and was it strong? Yeah? <laughs> well, it was detected overnight across the city, started in Lower Manhattan in the evening and travelled uptown before spreading out into neighbourhood neighbouring boroughs. There were hundreds and hundreds of calls to the city's emergency phone line. And as the New York, York Times reported, the aroma not only revived memories of childhood but in a city scared by terrorism, it raised vague worries about an attack deviously cloaked in the smell of grandma's kitchen. The interesting thing there was there was another one um, in 2007, but it wasn't um, such a pleasantly, potentially pleasantly perceived smell, which was um, pungent, sulfurous, and gas-like, detected across large areas of Manhattan and eastern New Jersey. Anyone remember this one? No, less. Uh, perhaps it was less um, unusual because it's, it's perhaps a smell that we're more likely to associate with cities, strangely enough. And that resulted in an emergency response across the city. So the schools and offices and the subway station were closed um, in response to fear of gas leak. And in both cases, um, previous cases as well, um, city officials used the monitoring equipment to check that it wasn't the toxic odour. Um, Esther Wu tried to document how smells move around the city. And here she... Um, looked at the, uh, it was the, what's it called, the baking donuts at, um, what's the, bake, the famous baking donuts store? Dunkin', is it Dunkin' Donuts? Yeah, it was Dunkin' Donuts. Um, she was a student here in New York and every day she walked past and she mapped it and she considered factors of the temperature, the wind flow, but sadly the results were inconclusive. Um, there's been articles on the smelliest block in New York, um, which is deep in the Lower East Side, a terrible home to look. Where is it coming from? There's an article online there, which afterwards, if anyone's interested, I'll flip back to this slide and you can take that down. Um, and a friend of mine, um, Kate McLean, has been mapping some of these, mapping how smells move around the environment, and uh, that's available, you can see that online as well. Now, the... Um, the sheets that people kind of were completing today as we were undertaking this smell walk, um, we're, going, we're building a world smell map project where we're going to not only map smells, but we'll get everybody out there as crowdsource to map odours as they walk around the city. We're also getting to say what they think about them so we can kind of examine how that changes across space and across time as well. But now to just look at the implications for urban design and architectural practice. Well, I've looked at, um, whenever I've done the smell walks on a one-to-one -one basis, I ask people, I stop in certain places and I ask people to rate how much they like an area and how much they like its smellscape. Um, and to do, they do this on a one-to-seven scale. Um, and on this case, they were doing it, these, these results were on the one, a one-to-five scale, similar to the one they use today, but just shorter. Um, and there is a statistically significant relationship between how people rate the smellscape and how they rate the place. Now, there are all sorts of complex reasons for that. Part of it is because we're not used to rating the smellscape, so there are people that certainly would rate that just the same because they kind of weren't really sure, and so they say, oh, it's a five for, I like the place, and five for its smell. But what was interesting in this, and I'm not particularly a numbers person, I'm more kind of qualitative researcher, what was interesting is examining how people rated, if there was no smell, 
in one area they would rate that differently than they did in another area and it was down to expectations. So they expected areas like um, the shopping centre area, they were far, less ex far more accepting of no smells in that area than they were if they were in the markets area. If they didn't detect smell in the markets area, then they felt that something was wrong. Um, which has kind of all sorts of influences when we think about when we design in areas. Also, when we think about legibility, the way that we navigate our way around the city, there are all sorts of smell marks, and they don't have to be what we think of as good smells traditionally. It also includes smells that we think of as less good. Um, so there was a particular, um, in, in Doncaster, which is the area that you see on the map here, there were all sorts of smells that people detected on a daily basis as they walked down the street. Some of them they really didn't like. But they could have closed their eyes and they knew exactly where they were. It helped in navigating the way around the city. So it was it does serve that purpose. Um, as you know, examples, Henderson's relish, um, which Nicola uh, referred to in the introduction. Um, here in Seattle, in the International District, there was the Fortune Cookie Factory. Um, and there are all sorts of different smells on both a micro and a much larger scale that um, it influence kind of legibility around the city. But design tools. When I ask designers and architects um, what sorts of things might we think about when we're designing with smell, um, often they scratch their head and kind of say, well, we could introduce certain scents, as I referred to earlier. But actually, when I walked in environments with them, I'd say, well, what sort of factors do you think of influencing the smell environment? And through that, they were able to identify um, the, the different um, factors within that environment that were influencing uh, everyday experiences of smell. So, you know, when you kind of see this, pretty obvious really, of course, you know, um, the ability of air to move in the microclimates, um, activity density, density and concentration, the topography, um, a restorative environmental aspects, each of these I'll just kind of give you an example of. So air movement and microclimates. Um, now some areas clearly in enclosed areas such as this one and captures the smells much more. So when we think about what's in there, and depending on a particular place, it might be a certain smell that we perceive in a positive light, it will kind of it will build in one particular area where you don't have the wind flow. Um, whereas there are certain areas like a, a highly trafficked street where it's good to have that vent, that wind blowing strongly down there because it actually helps disperse those odours that are generally more negatively perceived. Um, Interestingly, I took this picture in Paris um, earlier this year in La Défense, um, where they were highlighting um, issues around global warming, thermal comfort, um, and they showed this uh, diagram, which was um, a piece of street furniture that had been designed so you could kind of escape the, the bright sunlight and you could kind of get a bit of shadow. But also the same occurs with smell as well, which the, the built environmental form, which is something that as architects and urban designers we're always working with, um, also influences the, that smell environment. Activity concentration clearly influences the smell environment. When we think about international districts and the likes, you know, Chinatown, Little Italy, um, it's the concentration that really um, influences those kind of those smell experiences in those places. And when we think of topography as well, the ability of the drains to kind of drain away um, the odours of the, uh, the sewage, um, when we think there were certain areas where we were walking today where really you've got that smell of waste quite strongly. Um, and it's much harder in many flat areas actually for that to be kind of draining away. But also when we think of um, the position of bus stops under windows um, that and residential blocks, um, that has a significant impact as this um, this quote from the New York Times in 2006 shows there's, um, this, uh, there was a woman living in East Harlem with her family, um, which I'm sure you're aware has one of the highest asthma rates in the country, um, that particular area. And, um, and she explained, and we had this similar case of this in all the, sub all the main cities in England where we carried out research as well, is if I don't keep those windows closed, that smell rises up and comes in. They smell like diesel, a nasty stench entering the house. So where we actually place things like our bus stops has an influence, but also things like traffic lights. If we have traffic lights on a hill, 
Um, and you know we have uh, buses parked there and then setting back off that's likely to emit much more kind of fumes as they set off up the hill than it would be on a flat and so just thinking about simple things like that as planners and engineers and um, they can all have influence but just finally before I kind of come, come to an end um, restorative environmental aspects as well. Um, some of you may have heard of um, the idea of restorative, restorative environmental aspects. These are basically the areas we go to to escape from city life, the stresses, stresses and strains of city life. And um, most famously, they're thought of as parks and gardens and places where we can just sit and contemplate life for a little while. Um, but actually, uh, the studies that have been carried out, most of them are focused on the way things look. Um, so, you know, show someone a picture of a tree and they're likely to be less stressed. But actually the same holds true for smell as well. And it doesn't just have to be those green areas. It can be green, it can be favourite spaces, even if it's a little cafe, or they can have that kind of response of relaxing the body. Um, and that's all to do with our kind of our personal associations. And how can this be used? Well, I'm not advocating that we go around designing great smelly places wherever, um, because I think there's a role for different types of spaces. And this kind of study that I carried out, which rated the different sensory experiences through a city as you move through it, um, down one particular street, highlighted that there were very different areas, and um, very different sensory stimuli in each of those areas. And one could, um, by exploring that, um, think about redesigning areas, um, but actually making sure that you still had that, the ups and downs. It, you know, a, a one area in Doncaster is the medieval core, um, so it's got kind of a highly historic infrastructure, um, which influences the smells of the drains. It's not the greatest smelling place, but actually people really like the way that it looks and the way that it feels to actually be in that area. So to conclude, um, Odour and place perception um, are like linked, which I don't think would be any great surprise to someone. If you go to even your favourite place, if it really smells, you're not going to hang around for very long. Um, but it operates on a, on a subtler level than that as well. Um, a wide range of odours can be detected, um, but generally people don't realise that unless they think about it and walk along the street and really start to appreciate that. Um, and a range of processes are used those kind of the separation, the masking and the likes um, in an attempt to control smell in the environment. Um, there are a range of tools that we can think about that can easily be adapted into our everyday practices to just think more proactively about smell and to recognise what important smells already exist in the smellscape of any particular area that we're designing. Um, and we can actually make those smells visible as well and engage with communities in different areas by mapping those. Um, but, and I think this is a really important fact that relates back to how the sense of smell works, smell perception is highly individually, socially and culturally situated. So what one person will think of as a good smell is not necessarily something that another group of people or another person will think of, so we have to be very careful about how we do that. And it's time to move over onto the questions. I have actually on there put the project blog as well. I lead a project in Manchester on Smell and the City. And if anyone's interested in learning more about that, the blog site is there, which I'll keep in the background while we answer some questions. And there's my um, Twitter address there as well. But if anyone has any questions that they don't actually ask now and want to get in touch with me, then that, you know, I welcome that as well. So just give me a shout afterwards. Qualitative for that? 
And well, there are certain smells that certainly, um, despite made the caveat that people can perceive smells differently, there are certain smells that clearly we think about um, right across the board as quite negative. So you know, the rotting smells generally are going to be thought of more negatively. We know that the st strong smells, super strong smells, you know, all of us are not going to like. Those, there are smells that are clearly bad for us as well. So there are kind of certain rules that can be established and are established in different types of legislation across most of the world, um, which is, you know, that you don't want to have these kind of pollutants where people are because they can be bad for us, not only in terms of um, the smell directly affecting us, but also in terms of our quality of life issues. So there are certain rules that are there anyway within a lot of legislation and some of it's quite stringent um, but in terms of thinking about design practice um, I think um, the answers really are rooted in local perceptions of smell um, and I kind of advocate an approach where um, a lot of uh, you know work is done actually find out what smells are in an area rather than I know that when we used to build something new we never thought about the smells we think about right great that there's a historic building here we need to protect the views to that building but we didn't really think about the important smells in that area some of those place related odors um, and which smells will be important to a particular area are likely to change, although there can be themes. So it could be themes such as a particular form of vegetation, and it, the, the type of vegetation may vary from place to place. Um, well, that could be quite important to people. It could be certain like, food or odours and the likes. And so there are sort of certain rules that can be laid down um, and, and thought about when we think, think about design and smellscapes in towns and cities. Did anyone uh, detect, is anyone a caveman? Yeah, we've got, whoa. I smell Brilliant, and you've got the smell of the body odour? Yes. Yeah, and did you think it was really strong or? I think it's smell of back, back there. <laughs> yeah, so I hope we can pull the lid off. <laughs> yeah. How about the others? It didn't smell like body odour to me, it had a very subtle, I, I was there, but I couldn't tell what it really was. Almost slightly floral. Almost. Yeah. Slightly. Yeah, I kind of get that with it as well. And at the back. Yeah, it was the same thing. It's more like a muscadine grease skin. It's funny. I've smelled it like five or six times. Then I was, I was beginning to smell. It was, it was, it was floral, but it was sweaty underneath. <laughs> Yeah. Could you? Yeah. Um, this molecule. Well, I'm not perfume, so. Yeah. <laughs> but this molecule, for example, is typically described as being also very musky and very, very sensual. And you're going to find this molecule if you smell the, the perfume of Costume National scent, the very first one. You will find this molecule in it. And um, that's why probably this smell has it, its uh, official. Uh, of aficionados and uh, sometimes it's very repressive for people but it's definitely something that attracts people and people need gravity. Yeah. I mean, what, is, what I think is fascinating, particularly about that smell, apart from the fact that some people can detect it and some can't, is that even those people that can't detect it, if they smell it every day for six weeks, then they can detect it. <laughs> and it's like our body kind of adapts. And there's two things that I didn't mention in my presentation is adaptation and habituation as well with smell. I mean, habituation is, say, your, um, the smell of your home you wouldn't detect because we're so used to it, our body doesn't kind of consciously register it in our, to our consciousness. Um, not that very well, but you know what I mean. Um, whereas, um, the, the, when, in terms of um, adaptation, um, we're, our olfactory receptors get tired. And so if you go into a room and you can smell something after 20 minutes, unless it's particularly strong, we don't smell it anymore because our nose is tired. And if you walk away 10 minutes, five minutes, you come back, um, then you smell it. And so this is something that the perfumers um, will frequently have to take breaks because of the, uh, this kind of adaptation effect. Um, I had a question about, I guess you could almost say, uh, like normalizing uh, people's expectations for sense. And so I feel like we live in an era where 
you know, if, if, if you can get something declared a syndrome or a, or, a, or a shortcoming that can be cured through medication or that kind of thing, then, then someone is going to come up with that for you know, whatever it might be. Like if you get a headache inside a car, there's a pill I'm sure you could take. Um, but so I guess I'm curious if there's research into something that you would actually take a pill to smell the caveman scent. I mean, like for instance, it seems to be in the corporate interest of people like Old Spice or Right Guard for everyone to be able to smell the, the caveman thing because theoretically their deodorant sales will go through the roof. So is there is there research into sort of like normalizing the human body so that we can in fact make everyone, you know, run in horror from certain <clears throat> smells and gravitate towards others? And if there is, who's backing that research? I don't mean like the equivalent of glasses or prescription contact yeah. lenses yeah. for smell. Yeah. Or, or maybe the other way for those people that um, can smell it, right. taking them the other way. It's the answer in the genes because the reason why uh, some people can detect it, some can't, it's all about the ordering of our genetic makeup. So, kind of, if we've got two good smell genes um, that, that, that relate to that one particular odour, and it's only because genetics is such a, um, a new thing and so little has been known about a smell, but genetic. Old fat smell mapping has been, you know, it's relatively unheard of. There's actually uh, Leslie Bossell, who um, is a scientist at the Rock, uni is it University of Rock, is that Rock Rockefeller Rock University? Yes. Um, she, I'm, I'm meeting her tomorrow, and she's the one who did um, all this work on the androstenum, and she found these fa facts around her. She tried all sorts of different smells and only found this response to the androstenum. She actually also found gen uh, gender and um, Racial, which is very hard to, but she tied it to genetic, um, to genetic correlation too, um, between smell preferences in New Yorkers. So, for example, males were more likely to prefer menthol and something else that I can't remember. But uh, she she managed to tie this to certain sort of genetic correlations too. So it was it was a I, I can't pretend to understand it, but it was absolutely extremely both um, cutting edge and you know the first time that those sorts of correlations have been found. So that if that research continues, it's quite an interesting avenue. Yeah, I mean that's certainly to answer that question. That's certainly where that answer would lie in kind of genetics, um, looking at genetics and a research all around that would be something that um, would kind of pick up those kind of issues. Um, you touched on age, but um, can you talk a bit more about the, the effects of smell and memory with youth, if you have to do background on that? Um, I mean, what I, just on that issue of age, um, I mean, one of my sons um, recently did a work experience um, in an in a elderly residential home, and he came home, home at um, that night and he said, oh, Mum, it really smells in there. And, um, and this is something that I'm doing some research on as well, is around scenting of um, those kinds of environments, because many of the people, the residents in the homes, um, won't be detecting the odours that are in there, um, whether they've, it's because they've adapted, habituated to their smells, or actually their sense of smell has depleted so much that they no longer smell that. But it does have an impact on them, I would argue, in terms of quality of life. Because if you have um, people visiting, family visiting, children that are going to smell these odours, then it's automatically going to affect them. And I know from visiting my own grandparents in homes, that um, I sometimes found it difficult to take the children there, and we kind of, you know, the, the, it's, they can sometimes not be very pleasantly smelly places. And so um, we're looking at different ways that we can maybe consider smell. And part of that is down to the poor air quality in those kinds of environments as well, the poorly ventilated, they don't want the older people to get cold, um, all those kinds of things. Um, that only deals with that kind of the age issue. Um, in terms of the memory thing, um, you know, the, for younger people, it works exactly the same. You know, as it is doing for the rest of us, it transforms. You know, my children will associate the smell of games, for example. They might have got three boys. They like the smell of games. Um, you know, which um, I actually was talking to someone who was looking at redesigning the environment of a game store, electronic game store, because they thought it smelled really bad. And saying, well, my sons go to them and they really like those smells. So this is all that individual positionality, or what you like in the world, what you like the smell of. Um, I know there's been some research and development of materials that 
dampen or absorb smell or sound and pollution. And I was wondering if there are any materials that can affect the way that sound travel or smell travels through space. And, I mean, vegetation is one of the clear ones that we can think of. Um, there's actually been um, work where they've, uh, around factories, looked at planting to try and mitigate some of the smells that are uh, emitted. I think, from the top of my head, I think that was in some Chinese factories. Um, and actually, the results were found to be limited. Um, but certainly, planting um, will change the way that people will perceive the smell environment, and water will as well. So when I show those kind of restorative factors, um, if you introduce those, you know, if you have um, a water feature in an environment, generally people will think that the air quality is better. And they'll also think that the smell environment is better, even if they can't detect the smells or the, you know, the air quality is just as bad. Now, when we think about that, you think, well, are we kind of manipulating people? And this is something that comes up a lot when I talk to people about smell design. The idea of in the supermarkets, bread pumped out to make us buy more. I don't know, you know, I don't know if you, it's certainly in the UK is a well-known example. People think of that. But, and they always talk about manipulation. I don't like the idea of being manipulated. But what I say to people is, why is that any different to thinking about, you know, as designers, the way things look? or the way things sound, you know, we know the stores are laid out to maximise sales, so why is it different from smell? And part of that is because, you know, we breathe it and we don't have any choice about it, if there's something that, you know, something that we don't like the look of, we look away, but in terms of smells, we breathe them in, we have no choice about it, and people fear this kind of loss of control and think they're going to behave in a way that they wouldn't do otherwise, but that's certainly not the case. I mean, all the marketing studies, um, you know, reviews of those, I found that really a smell will kind of make people dwell more so that is one thing that has been found but there's no evidence that it kind of is going to dramatically change moods and those kinds of things. Does anyone ever uh, done a study on uh, uh, smell attitude and head owners? Thinking of people that have let's say several cats or several dogs uh, There might be a correlation, but I Yeah, um, I've not seen any studies like that to answer that. What I would say, you know, smokers, you know, clearly.